introduction. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for joining me. Uh, I have uh, a lot of books. Uh, I like to read them from my library, uh, and then after I've read them and I love them, I buy my own copy uh, so that I can lend it out to people. Uh, the troubling problem with that is that I have uh, hundreds of books, but I don't have any of them. I have no idea where they are. Um, so I really needed to answer these kind of hard questions. Um, so uh, this is me. Uh, I have a little bit of a red overlay. Uh, these are the places you can follow me on Twitter or on GitHub. Uh, there is the code for uh, the demo application. Uh, you can run it on a Raspberry Pi. There's a couple of tutorials to follow. So um, this is a red screen of death. Um, oh, it's because it did that. OK, well, that'll be fun. Uh, so I'm a software engineer at Vary. That's an IoT consultancy. Uh, so a lot of times we'll use Python. We also use Elixir and Nerves pretty heavily. Um, C is also pretty common. Um, so you can blame them for me having an interest in having so many extra things uh, such that I can give a talk. So I had to make some assumptions about you, uh, which is you minimally like libraries, both Python and, and the book uh, kind of library. Uh, you probably also have a, a Pi hanging around that you either bought and you don't know what to do with, or you just got one of the new fancy Pi 4s, and you're just like, what do I do? Maybe I can look for some inspiration. Um, so if that's you, then you're in good company, because uh, maybe this is an idea for you. So what we're going to do is um, we're going to follow along. The code for uh, the application is here. If you feel like cloning it later, I'll also tweet out these links just in case. Nobody has to worry about uh, snapping pictures or anything. So we're going to look at, um, this is like an IoT project, right? We're going to be doing uh, a thing, which is a book, which is not a computer. And we're going to be putting it onto a web server, right? So we're going to have the internet and a thing together. Um, so after we look at the thing, which is all of these uh, fancy words that we'll talk about later, uh, then we're going to look at a Flask app that we're going to staple to it. We're going to talk about some of the trade-offs you have to make if you choose to go the route that I went for this application. Um, and yeah, we'll kind of like see what there is and isn't. So um, why even give this talk? So I'm from Grand Rapids, Michigan, uh, and I like Ohio more than you might think. Uh, so I'm really <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, this is the Grand Rapids Public Library. It's one of the coolest buildings downtown. Uh, it's this beautiful, ornate, old-looking uh, uh, building. But there's also a really modern, uh, cylindrical, lots of windows uh, building attached to it, which is where all the stacks are. So like, when you walk in, it's marble, like marble floors, wooden staircases, very cool. And then you can still get all the cool modern amenities. Um, so I had this RFID reader around from a different project, um, something I was at working on at work, and uh, I went to the library and I was at like the checkout process, and it's fascinating, right? Um, it used to be the checkout process was you had a um, uh, you had like a, a card in the back of every book, and you have to write something down. There were stamps, uh, and I feel old. So we're going to talk about the new process. The new process is uh, you take all of your books, uh, you take your ID card, you scan yourself in, and then you set your books down on a pad, and it says boop 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 boop. Did you want to borrow these four books? You say yes, I did, and then you're on your way. You get email updates about you know when your books do, when you should bring them back, um, everything. It's fantastic. Um, and I wanted to know you know what would it be like? What went into making that? Um, so I started looking at the back of all of the books that I had borrowed, and they all had these stickers on them, and I recognized those as an RFID sticker. So um, the other reason for giving this talk is because I just joined an IoT consultancy about six months ago. It's not my first foray into embedded, um, but you know it's terrifying. When you're working on web code or you're working on like a, a Jupyter notebook, you're not worried about electrocuting yourself or setting things on fire. <laughs> uh, but I, like, even on this project, I was convinced that I was going like, to spark myself or set a fire on my desk. Um, and I think that that's very scary. Uh, in general, fire and electricity, while cool, also scary. Um, but what was fascinating to me about learning this and, and putting this application together was that, uh, sort of obnoxiously so, Python was just waiting for me at every single step to say, hey, you need some help with that? <laughs> hey, you need some help with that? Um, it didn't help me not electrocute myself, but OK. Um, the other reason was, so I actually started uh, writing an Elixir app to make an internet-connected tiddlywinks game. Uh, you can ask me about that later. I'll be in the hallway. Uh, but when, when I was uh, working on the Elixir app, uh, 
when I'm trying to like do something new, I don't like to reach for um, somewhat foreign tools. And I'm newish to Elixir, or I was when I was building this. I'm a little bit better now, still pretty bad. But uh, I was trying to set up the Pi and the RFID reader to work together, and I found this Pi at My Life article, and uh, it took me through every step, all the way, right? So this is another uh, example where um, I used Python libraries to kind of figure out, would this even work? Could this work in something like 20 minutes? Um, I wound up writing a you know full fleshed out application once I knew that it would work. Um, but just to get things know, like known and in a comfortable spot, um, I found that Python was there. So this was the, the jump off article. And if you're interested in getting started, um, I think I have it on the high part of the slide too, because I remember that whenever you put links on the bottom of a thing, it's always like, how do you see that? Um, so hopefully it's up there later. But I just thought it was telling that Python was the first place uh, that I went to to write my Elixir app. Okay, uh, so if we're ready, uh, let's let's get into it. Let's let's start hooking things up and, and getting them together. So in an Internet of Things project, you have to think about the thing. Uh, I think based on uh, the uh, chat beforehand, most of us know. But if we don't, uh, this is a Raspberry Pi. It is a uh, small computer. Uh, it is relatively cheap as computers go. It's very small, but the size of a credit card. Um, it has a lot of really, really cool things on it. It's very easy to hook up peripherals to it. Um, we're going to be using these fancy little GPIO pins uh, for connecting our RFID reader, but you, you can do USB and um, HDMI and all sorts of good stuff. I do actually have it here. So if you're at the sprints, I'm going to try and get it set up um, just to kind of like play around with, but we can do that later. Um, do the thing. No, no, the other thing. That thing. So as soon as you install uh, Raspbian, which is a, a flavor of Linux for Raspberry Pi, uh, it's like Debian, but Raspberry Pi specific, um, you can immediately get a red fun screen. Uh, <laughs> you can launch a, a terminal, and Python is already there waiting for you, like, hey, do you need some help? Uh, <laughs> so this is the Python 5.3.5 shell, because that comes in uh, in Raspbian. I did not diverge from that, even though I wanted to, because I really like Python's uh, 3, 7, and later. But um, it's already a good, nice, modern version of Python just hanging out. So the next part of our Internet of Things application, or our thing, is, is RFID chips. So it stands for Radio Frequency Identification. Uh, so I said it's in the library checkout. It's also in all of my Amiibos. Um, does anybody here uh, have an access key card to get into work or has been to the fire festival? Wow, a lot, of, <laughs> a lot of people went to the fire festival. That's very unexpected. Um, no, don't do that. Don't do the thing. So the reason RFID is really cool for things uh, is these three characteristics, power, data, and size. So uh, for passive RFID, uh, they were, the tags require absolutely no power. Uh, when they're in the radio field of the reader, that is enough to generate enough power to read and write data to and from them. Um, so in terms of you know, the longevity of how long I want to identify this thing, uh, RFID is, is nearly unparalleled for technological ways of, of identifying a thing. Uh, it can also store data. Uh, the, uh, there are different uh, types of RFID, the one that we're using stores one, one kilobyte of data. So it's not like a lot of data, um, but, but it's not nothing. You can store some stuff there. Uh, it can also store its identification number, so it's RFID. Um, and they're also really good because the size of them, the ones that I'm looking at and the ones that I'm using is a sticker. So you can really put it kind of anywhere, right? Uh, anything that just kind of needs to, to have this attached to it, it's really easy to get in there. Now there is also active RFID, uh, which it's got a much bigger range, uh, but it does require that the tag itself has a battery. So that's useful in like livestock tracking uh, or just larger range uh, applications. The, the ones that we're using have about a centimeter of range, uh, so you actually have to get pretty close to them. The ones at the Grand Rapids Public Library are much bigger. I think it has like a 10 to 15 centimeter range, so you can set down uh, many books. I think mine would work with many books if we did like all comic books or like <laughs> magazines or something, like little thin things. Um, but yeah, so that's what makes RFID appealing for, for a you know, tracking project. So I think this is a hurdle that gets often ignored, um, but one of the hurdles to getting into a project like this is actually buying stuff. Uh, 
these are Amazon links, and I don't recommend going to Amazon to buy things. Um, there's a lot of fake or bad ones. I happen to get pretty lucky uh, because these are very, very commonplace, and I happen to knew, know the two companies that made these um, from previous experiences. So it went okay. Um, but I think this is kind of a little bit of a sidebar, but I think that people will use kind of Raspberry Pis as a, this is a great uh, introductory or very accessible uh, computer to use. And I think that's partially true. Because you have a $35 computer, and that, that's, that's good. That's fantastic, right? Um, but you have to have an SD card. You have to have an SD card reader. You have to have a computer that can write an SD card. Uh, you have to have, well, yeah, I guess you can get, buy the ones included that have uh, noobs. The Raspberry Pi Foundation does sell those, which is good. Um, you have to have, if you're using sort of a desktop environment, a mouse and a keyboard, uh, cabling to get to a display. So by the time you kind of got all that done, you're sitting at a couple hundred dollars worth of kit, right? So it goes from super accessible price point to super easy if I already have access to technology to buy even more things. This is gonna be fun. So that's just a little bit of a sidebar. I still think that like, I'm gonna, after saying that, say I got all of this kit for about 10 bucks. Um, I wound up buying 50 uh, tags because I have a library that I wanted to tag everything for or I wanted to make a tiddlywinks game, so I'm just gonna need a lot of RFID <laughs> chips. Um, you don't have to buy that many for all of your applications. So that kind of boosted the price of mine a little bit. So, oh, this is even worse. Okay, cool, uh, that's actually a really good thing. So this is a wiring schematic that you can find on the, this Pat My Life article. It is about as helpful as it looks. Uh, this is our RFID reader, this is a breadboard, and these are these cables. Uh, I actually have in my speaker notes, if you're colorblind, good luck. But because it actually does look better on, on my screen, but it is not easy to read, right? Like, what are these? Is this definitely the right orientation? Who knows? Um, but uh, there is a little bit better of a diagram to work with. Um, so the RFID reader communicates over a protocol called SPI, Serial Peripheral Interface. Uh, so that is a GPIO related task. So uh, the way that SPI works is you have an unfortunately named master, in our case it will be the Raspberry Pi 3, and we have a slave device which will be the RFID reader. So they really need, the, the three most important things are MOSI, MISO, and S-Clock. So MOSI is master out, slave in, which means this is the Pi talking to the RFID reader. There's also MISO, which is uh, master in, slave out, so it is the RFID reader sending information back to us. So this is gonna be the way that we're gonna send data to and from uh, the RFID reader which will then, for us, send information to the RFID tag. Um, they need to know when to send each other messages so they have a clock. So the nice too long didn't read, um, you can see that on this diagram they at least call out the GPIO as SPI related, right? SPI, SPI, SPI. Um, and you need to do um, this. So in short, you really just need to get to this part of the article and understand how to count the pins um, on your Raspberry Pi. So in reality, uh, this is what it looks like. It's not that cool looking, but it's kind of cool looking because it's got wacky wires uh, and it works on my desk and I should probably get a case if I'm that worried about being electrocuted. Um, but at this point you'd say, okay, cool, we've hooked up the interfaces, uh, the RFID reader speaks over SPI, uh, Raspberry Pi speaks over SPI, we're good to go, right? Like we're off to the races. Um, not so, there's one more step, uh, which is you have to enable the SPI uh, interface. And so this is a little bit of like Linux system administration, and I think this is another barrier to talk about. Um, other frameworks, so for example, if you're using Elixir and NURBS, uh, SPI will be enabled by default, and you don't have to do this. But Elixir isn't there to help you in most of the other ways. Python is. So we're gonna skip over this because you can read it later. So now that we know this, we have the SPI spec, we have the RFID reader specifications, and all it's gonna tell us uh, is the hard way to do things, uh, which is sending data, uh, flipping registers, uh, and doing insane things. Uh, this is the hard way of doing things, because you could read all of these and kind of formulate your own library, or you could find that Python is there to help you. Uh, so there's a fantastic library that interfaces with uh, the MFRC 522, it's called MFRC 522. Uh, you can pip install it. And really what we're trying to get to is these two functions, read and write. 
this is what we want to embed in our Flask application, right? We want to read data to the cards, or to the tags to say, you, this book is you. And then we want to uh, read from it when we say, okay, I'm going to check out a book. Which book am I holding up to you right now? So they're very small functions. Uh, and every time you interact with the tag, it will spit out the RFID and then whatever data was there. This should actually be called data. In my application, it's always the book title, so I called it title um, because naming things is hard. <laughs> cool. Uh, so we are now ready to, to kind of start seeing how this would work in uh, the world of a Flask app. So yeah, now we're at the inter internet level of things. Um, this is my sitemap. So I have a landing page, uh, and then I want three links to add new books, uh, to check out the, the status of my books. This page is probably the most interesting to me because this is the entire reason I wrote the application. Uh, these two are really cool because these are the ones that interact with the RFID reader. So register will allow me to uh, type in the name of a book, click a button, and say, okay, this is the book that I want to register. Great. And then it'll save it off into a SQLite database. Lending out the books works in, a, in an interesting way because I want to be able to check out multiple books at the same time to somebody. Uh, and so we did things just a little bit differently there. Um, read and write are architected a little bit differently and I'd love to talk about that uh, afterward, but I think we'll get a good idea for why I might have uh, done them up a little bit differently already. So uh, the least thingsy, the least RFID-y, the least uh, hardware oriented is inventory. Uh, so if you click inventory, it's going to go grab the books, all the books from the database, say, hey, here they are. It's going to display them for me. Um, not terribly exciting, but I do have buttons for, um, you know, return the book, which basically sends, sets the Lendy field to, to zero out. Uh, and then I have the ability to delete it in case um, one of my friends decides that they're going to keep the book. Okay, so this is what it looks like. Uh, I've lent the room to uh, my friend Jace, and so this is what the inventory screen will look like, um, just to give you an idea of how it rendered. I am not a designer, uh, so this is the HTML that I'm very proud of. <laughs> <laughs> the next page is registering a book, uh, and this page has a bug on it, and I wonder if anybody can already see it? If not, I'll describe the behavior of the screen, and maybe we'll figure it out from so what I do is I type in the title of the book here, then I click Submit, and then it goes to a blank screen. What? Okay. What's happening here is that right, we're going to actually have to look at the code in the RFID module. So what does write do? Oh. It's a while loop. So write is a blocking operation that will hold on uh, until it gets something. So my screen, you click, you say, I'm going to you know, enter Gone with the Wind, click, goes blank. Because Flask doesn't know what to render yet. It is stuck here. I thought this was OK for me, because I can still touch the book to the pad, and then all of a sudden Flask knows what to do, and it takes me back to uh, the index page, and the book has been registered. Um, but it is definitely a bug. There is also a write no block, and I'm convinced, and I was very, very close to solving uh, this problem using uh, Trio to do some async uh, SPI library, like building a wrapper around it and say, like, let's do this thing the right way. Um, but July 26 got here much faster than I thought it was going to. So there's another uh, uh, you know, method that would be there to help, which is we could stream things. I didn't actually know this uh, for a good while, but Flask can do uh, partial renders using a generator, and it can yield stuff a little bit at a time. Uh, this is a really nice tutorial for kind of seeing how this would work. I did have this in the application uh, in an earlier state when I was trying to really um, go the hard way of doing things, where I would have you know buttons and the header be rendered, and then uh, yield what was in the, the scans list uh, for a while. I think that these are pretty cool ideas, um, and I'll definitely be working on it at the sprints tonight to get it to work 
using this or to, to have it wrapped up in a way that uh, is sort of like the right thing to do. But for my application, uh, this is basically me. <laughs> and you just saw all my slides. So we've upgraded this bug to a design. Uh, I'm the reader, or I'm the person who's putting all the books into the database. I'm okay with this behavior. Um, I'm not doing many books at once, so I'm going to call that um, a feature of the application. So when we hit the Lend Books application, we can see that this is a little bit different. So what's going on here? We click Lend Books and we go to the scanning route. So scanning is going to uh, give the reader one second to look at its surroundings and say, do a non-blocking read in case you see more than one tag and append this into a set called scans. So just tell me everything that you see in this one second. And then it'll find all of the books from there uh, and set their, or, um, and keep those into a list and then render them as, hey, these are the books that I saw in this one second. Uh, that's a pretty bad UX. Um, actually, I think that works at the, uh, the library, like the Grand Arcus Public Library, because they have a big um, scanning box and you can set like five books at a time. Um, but for me, like I said, I, I have just about a centimeter or maybe a centimeter and a half of range. Um, so this is a really bad um, example of, you know, this, is, this would be a really tough UX to work with. You gotta scan all the books in one second, right? Just like put them on a big, uh, like flat something and just run them by. Um, I don't know, it could be interesting. So the, the kind of troubling thing is, is that um, that's not what I wanted to do, right? I wanted to be able to keep scanning more books, and I didn't want to have to just like flash all of them by the RFID reader uh, in one second. <sighs> yeah. So we talked about uh, this async and this streaming uh, bit, and I think that's probably the correct solution. Uh, there's probably a good way to make an isolated service that has the ability to accept commands to say, hey, start scanning. Tell me what you've seen so far. Hey, stop scanning. That's probably the right thing to do. Um, but you can also add a script tag into your uh, front end to refresh the page every quarter second. So the net effect of this is my reader has about a second to look at its surroundings, which turns out to be enough time to see most books in kind of like a responsive way. And then my web application knows to re-render. So it says, okay, wh what are all the, the scans that you've seen so far? Let me render all of them for you. So I think that even though this is pretty hacky, uh, it was really a good balance between, you know, uh, responsivity of, or responsiveness of the reader and responsiveness of the web application. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that this is a pretty simple solution too. And if we really believe that simple is better than complex, um, you know, three lines of JavaScript shouldn't hurt our feelings. <laughs> so again, uh, JavaScript was there, wait, I used to say Python was there to help. In this case, JavaScript was there to help. And just because it's a Python conference, we don't want to say, uh oh, no, we're going to be really excited because every single time a language is there to give us a boost, that's fantastic, right? Be like Python, be like JavaScript. If anybody needs help, you should be there like, hey, you need help with that? And I think that's a really good thing to do. Um, I do have a couple of videos that I uh, forgot to uh, show off. Hopefully they'll render in some sort of reasonable way so you can kind of get a feel for how it all works. So I entered two scoops of Django uh, and I said submit. So you see the application just kind of goes into a holding pattern. So now I have my two scoops with an RFID tag in it. There's my reader. Boop. Okay, I now have to check if it's in the inventory because I did a bad and I didn't do a UX. But I see two scoops of Django and it's not uh, lent out to anybody. So it works, right? That's like not terrible. I could probably have stayed in that state but I have to figure out how to isolate the uh, uh, RFID library and, and get it to read multiple times. We'll get there tonight maybe. And the way lending works is pretty similar. This is kind of what it looks like at the end of the day. So you can see in the top, the, the screen is always loading. It's like every quarter second. But as soon as I scan two scoops, it's there. And the reason I wanted a responsive 
front end was because that done button would never let me click it. So I'm going to lend this book out to Jace. So now Jace has two scoops of Django. So if I had let the RFID reader read infinitely, <laughs> right, and just keep looking for scans, we could never have the, the website get any chance to show me what it knows about. Right, it would always just sit there, and it would keep accruing scans, like the code would be running correctly, but we would have no idea about it. So again, we had to balance between, okay, here's the thing, and then here's the internet, right? What does a responsive uh, application look like for uh, using the scanner, and what does a responsive application look like when you're using the website? So I wanna go back for a couple of slides because, um, yeah. So now that we can kind of read the code and have seen the behavior, we see we get a second, and if it ever sees a scan, break out of that loop and let the website render. So again, this could be faster than the quarter second that the front end is gonna rebalance anyways. Um, yeah, it was a, it was a trade-off, but I think, I think I wound up liking it. No. Cool. Um, so check out once that all happens, uh, again, this is not interacting with the RFID reader. This is taking that global scans list, uh, resetting it, calling it a cart, uh, and then setting every lendee uh, in the cart to whoever I was trying to lend that book to. So then the database gets updated with, oh, you lent all of these things to Jace. Cool. Um, so that's the application. Uh, that is it, it in its entirety. So thank you so much for joining me, uh, for the chance to put this together, for the chance to share something that I really enjoyed doing. Um, thanks to Jace for helping me figure out a lot of things and for lending and borrowing books from me, um, for just being here. And I didn't remember that we didn't have time for Q&A, so uh, I wrote some hacks, which were some hopefully asked questions. Um, so my favorite books are Everything is Illuminated and Designing Data Intensive Applications. Um, if you know both of these books, this is a funny joke, but if you don't, it's on a, uh, a hopefully asked questions list. Uh, yes, I am going to try this async stuff tonight. Uh, I wanna give it another go. Um, but right now I kinda have a little bit of a block which is something that I would love to do differently. Uh, I coded a lot of this application on the Raspberry Pi itself. Uh, and that's not a wonderful experience because uh, Sublime Text is really unresponsive. VS Code is a memory hog. Uh, forget about IntelliJ. Um, basically, your only choice is some editors that aren't fantastic, uh, at least that I've worked with. But I did find a blog by Scott Hanselman uh, talking about VS Code running headlessly. So I'm gonna give that a shot and do it a little bit better. Um, I also tend to really like poetry for um, dependency and library management, um, or independence management, and it doesn't work on a Raspberry Pi right now, uh, or at least it didn't work on mine. So I'd like to figure that out. Um, this is probably the fun thing I'll be working on, which is uh, using the RFID reader as some kind of like external service, but we'll get there tonight. Um, and then I would prefer to have some more tests, because um, it's just a lot better than guessing. Cool, these are sources. Uh, if you're interested, uh, thanks so much for your time. Uh, it's been fantastic.